after receiving her uh, MD and doing a residency in Toronto, she came here to New York to do a fellowship at Wild Cornell and Memorial Sloan Kettering. And you have now been on the faculty at Columbia for, I think you joined the one year before I, I came. So seven years or eight, eight years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, that's great. So uh, we are super lucky to have you giving this talk and appreciate it a lot. Um, I will turn it over to you to take it away. Thanks, Doreen. Thanks, Alex. So today we're going to talk about surgery for stress urinary incontinence. Many people end up just doing the procedure they were taught, but there, there is some evidence behind which procedure you should choose. So to start off, we're going to talk about some basics of incontinence. The definition of incontinence is the complaint of any involuntary loss of urine. It's also very helpful when describing incontinence to specify the type, severity, precipitating factors, social impact, effect on quality of life, and whether or not the individual experiencing incontinence actually desires help, because not everybody does. The main types of incontinence are stress urinary incontinence, which we're going to talk about today. This is, according to the International Continent Society, the complaint of involuntary leakage with exertion, sneezing, or coughing. There is urgency urinary incontinence, previously called urge incontinence, which is the complaint of an involuntary leakage accompanied by or immediately preceded by urgency. Basically, you cannot get to the bathroom time. Then there is mixed incontinence, which is super common, and the complaints of an involuntary leakage of urine associated with urgency and also with exertion, effort, sneezing, or coughing. So the International Continent Society is the governing society for definitions of voiding dysfunction. And these are the official definitions. So stress urinary incontinence can negatively impact daily activities, sexual function, as well as psychosocial well-being. The lifetime risk of surgery for stress incontinence is estimated to be approximately 13.6%, so quite high. When evaluating stress urinary incontinence, one starts with a history and physical exam, validated questionnaires. The simplest questionnaire to use in your office is the UDI-6 and IAQ-7 a cough stress test where the patient with a fairly full bladder coughs and you see whether there's incontinence, as well as for some patients, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, urodynamic testing and cystoscopy. So the various treatments for stress urinary incontinence, whenever you're doing an OSCE exam, et cetera, you always start from least invasive to most invasive. So there are, and, and practice as well, actually. So we always start with conservative measures, Kegel exercises. Some patients who either do not want surgery or for whom the, the sort of reason for their incontinence is not quite clear. We, it's common to see some very old patients who cannot describe what makes them leak. You can try what's called an incontinence pessary device. These are also good for patients who are younger and still desire future children. There's pelvic floor physical therapy. I explained to patients that there, this is the difference between working out on your own versus working out with a, a personal trainer. There also is magnetic stimulation, the BTL Mcella. This has been widely marketed, but not quite yet studied. And in Europe, there is a medication called duloxetine, which is approved. So this is uh, the poison pressa. Patients can get this at the pharmacy and it comes in various sizes. It's a tampon-like device that one inserts. Overall, um, the feedback is that it's not the most comfortable, but probably a good device for patients who only leak, for example, during exercise. But again, it's not the most comfortable from what I understand. This is an incontinence pessary. We fit these in the office. They're various sizes. So um, basically we fit it just like a regular pessary. So we fit the patient for size. Um, and then one puts in the pessary. For older patients, usually it's just, usually, it's often usually just a trial to see what makes them leak. Um, this can be used in pregnant patients as well. And there are many patients who wear this who are younger and are still gonna have future children who wear this during the day, take it out every night or only wear it during exercise. It's washed with soap and water. 
So this is the magnetic chair or the BTL Amcella. It's in trials currently. One sits on the chair and literally through magnetic stimulation, um, this helps to contract and exercise the muscles. You could probably try it at any urology meeting. Um, they're fairly well marketed and present at meetings. So surgical treatments for stress urine incontinence include slings, both fascial and synthetic or mesh slings. Previously, the couple suspensions were popular, the Birch couple suspension and the MMK. There are as well uh, urethral bulking agents, and we'll talk about some less commonly used devices, the adjustable continence therapy or ACT, the artificial urinary sphincter, and the intravesical balloon or the VES air device. There are as well some not well-studied experimental therapies, including radiofrequency treatment, stem therapy, as well as vaginal lasers. Again, these are marketed widely, not very well studied for incontinence. So surgery for stress urinary incontinence. Before deciding on surgery, one must make sure that one has the correct diagnosis. We usually make sure that patients have tried conservative therapy. You'd be surprised what, what a job that uh, Kegel exercises or pelvic floor physical therapy, what improvement patients can get. You have to make sure that the patient's an acceptable surgical candidate. And as I mentioned before, it's very important in females to figure out whether the patient desires future pregnancy or not. The first uh, widely performed procedure was the Marshall Marchetti Kranz procedure, which was developed in 1949. This was a retropubic approach for the elevation and the fixation of the anterolateral aspect of the urethra to the posterior aspect of the pubic symphysis and the periosteum. So basically the periurethral tissue was fixed to the periosteum. The sutures were through the periurethral tissue, the anterior vaginal wall, and then the periosteum. So here's, here is a picture of sutures here going through the periurethral tissue and the periosteum. Uh, one of the main problems was that osteitis pubis occurred in up to 3% of patients, a very painful condition. Uh, due to both limited and poor term, long-term follow-up data, the procedure is generally not recommended. But you certainly will see patients who've had this procedure done before. In 1961, the birch culpa suspension was developed. This is the attachment of the periurethral fascia to Cooper's ligament on the other side, so not the periosteum. This then became the gold standard open suspension procedure, and later it was done laparoscopically. Here's a picture of the birch culpa suspension. One puts a finger in the vagina to elevate the per periurethral tissue and bladder neck, and sutures are then placed through Cooper's ligament. In studies, the continence rates were 85 to 90% in the first year, so comparable to slings, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. And after five years, the continence rate is approximately 70%. It's, this sounds low, but we'll talk about this a little bit more. In studies, the success rate really depends on what you decide is success. There is not long-term data on laparoscopic birch, partly because slings came into uh, practice more and laparoscopic birch was mostly abandoned. So let's talk about slings. The slings are definitely the most commonly done procedures. There is a pubovaginal sling, uh, which is a fascial sling done with either autologous fascia or cadaveric fascia. And this sling traditionally was at the bladder neck. There definitely are reports of fascial slings being done in the mid urethra. This is becoming a little bit more popular, for example, in Europe where uh, mesh slings are no longer allowed in some places. Then there are mid urethral slings. This can be done through a retropubic approach or transobturator approach. And as well, there are the single incision slings. So what is the best sling approach? Like I mentioned before, many people are just sort of used to doing the sling that they learned in residency. However, there are different options that should be discussed with patients. So let's talk first about autologous fascial slings. They were first described actually in 1933 using fascia lava, so quite a long time ago. Um, and it was, the sling was then popularized by Aldridge using rectus fascia in 1942. Success rates are 66 to 85%, again, depending on the definition. And compared to birch pull suspension, which 
previously was the gold standard, there's superior success for treating stress urine incontinence, but higher rates of complications. So who is the best candidate for an autologous fascial sling? And I do actually perform quite a large number, and there are people like Jerry Blavis who perform only fascial slings. Patients generally who do not want mesh, so you can tell patients that mesh, mesh slings have been studied for a long time, they're safe and effective, but nonetheless, there are patients who are very wary of mesh, very suspicious, and they do not want mesh. And that is somebody who should get an autologous fascial sling. Young patients, slings have been studied for approximately um, 20 years, but nonetheless, if you have a patient who's in their 30s, they're going to outlive the time that mesh slings have been studied. And you may want to consider an autologous fascial sling for this reason, whereas autologous fascial slings have really been for a long time. So we do know that they are effective and safe in the very long term. Patients with recurrent stress incontinence, patients, um, who have had a procedure before and now they're leaking again. Uh, stress incontinence following mesh complications from a sling. So if the patient has had a sling, it's eroded, they've had um, a urethroplasty, the mesh removed, I would not recommend putting in a mesh sling and most people wouldn't. This is somebody who should get an autologous fascial sling. Patients who are having concomitant surgery that compromises the urethra. The classic example is the urethra diverticulectomy. So many patients um, the literature is conflicting as to what, whether or not patients should get a concomitant sling at the time of urethral diverticulum excision. Um, and if a patient were to get, the sl uh, get a sling, a fascial sling is really the safest option. Then there are chronic pelvic pain patients. There are patients who have chronic pain, and no matter what, mesh does sometimes exacerbate pain. And um, you can counsel the patient on which type of sling they want, but in general, uh, a mesh sling has a higher potential to cause chronic pain uh, versus a fascia sling. Patients who have had prior radiation do not do well with mesh. There is definitely a higher risk of mesh complications in these patients. For a while, they were marketing a AMS was marketing a um, biologic sling. Um, however, the um, Biologic sling that they were marketing did not really pan out very well in studies, but a fa an autologous fascial sling is a good option. Then there are patients with neurogenic bladder who really do need a tight bladder outlet and are, who, for example, the neurogenic patient who's getting an augment and a metrophenoff who has a wide open uh, bladder neck and bladder outlet, this patient is a good candidate for a fascial sling. And the need for CIC. So then there are the patients who have weak bladders. Uh, but severe stress incontinence who do not empty well, who are going to need CIC. They already need CIC at baseline, but after your sling, for sure, they're going to need CIC. And those patients should not get a mesh sling, they should get a fascial sling. Um, so types of fascia you can use, you can either use rectus fascia, generally, uh, I take this from the same incision I'm passing the sling through just above the symphysis, and then not everyone has good rectus fascia, a great option is fascia lata, everyone has a lot of fascia lata, so you have to make, you do have to make a separate thigh incision. So this was a superbly well done study of uh, birch culpa suspension versus fascial sling from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it was a multi-center NIH funded randomized controlled trial with 520 women. At 24 months, the success of, which was very, very stringent. So no reported stress urine incontinence and a left that less than 15 gram pad weight rates for stress and constants were 66% for sling and 49% for birch. Again, this sounds like a really, really low success rate, but that's because their definition of success was so stringent. Um, so in this study by Albo and all, um, treatment satisfaction at 24 months was 86% for the sling and 78% for birch. That was patient's subjective success rate. Voiding dysfunction was more common in the sling group, 14% versus 2%. And there was a higher rate of treatment for urgency incontinence in the sling group, 27% versus 20% needed some type of treatment, usually anti-muscarinics for um, 
urgency and consonants. There was no difference in de novo urgency and consonants. It was low overall, 3% in both groups. And overall, the autologous fascial sling resulted in a higher rate of successful treatment, but greater morb morbidity than the birch culp suspension. Unfortunately, by the time this beautiful study came out, people were not really doing either of these procedures as much because of the development of mid-urethral slings. Mid-urethral slings are generally made of a synthetic material, mesh. They are tension-free. Theoretically, there's less anatomic distortion. They are based on a theory where the urethra is not obstructed, but kinks off with increased intra-abdominal pressure. They can be done as an outpatient procedure. The patient does not need to stay overnight. Generally, with an autologous fascial sling, the patient does stay overnight, and there are retropubic and transobturator approaches, as well as outside-in and inside-out approaches. We're going to talk about all these soon. So here is a picture of a retropubic sling. The trocars and sling go through the retropubic space. Uh, not really through any structures, really through the retropubic space, versus a transobturator sling, which goes through the transobturator through the obturator space, as you know, which is full of muscle. So retropubic slings, we'll talk about first. The retropubic sling was uh, based on a dynamic kinking theory um, called the integral theory of kinking off the urethra, and was first developed based on this theory in 1996. The cure rate is approximately 80 to 90% at more than three years. And this original um, device was a bottom up sling. They had, it, it included a catheter guide to move the urethra around, which I've never used, um, and giant chokers with a handle. So the original kit is actually still available, I believe, uh, but I think very few people. Um, do this approach with a catheter guide and large show cars, et cetera. The same company now has a much slimmer device called the TBT Exact, which is much more widely used. So the original study was a prospective open multi-center study done in Scandinavia and in Sweden, including 131 patients with fresh urine incontinence. 91% of patients were cured and 7% were significantly improved at 12 months. There were 2% of failures. Complications included two hematomas and one bladder perforation, which we'll discuss later, is really not a big deal. Um, because this study was done in Sweden with a single payer system, a super organized government that can trace everybody down, um, at 11 years, 69 patients of the initial cohort of 90 evaluated uh, were evaluated at 11 years. At 11 years, 77% considered themselves to be improved, which is very good. 95% had a negative cough test and 90% had negative uh, pad test. This, this study would be very difficult to reproduce in any other um, geographic location other than Scandinavia. So amazingly, at 17 years, so there's great data on this mid urethral sling, 17 years, 78% of the original 90 women were evaluated by clinic visit or telephone interview. Some of these patients were kind of elderly at the time, so some of them had passed away. Um, so they really were able to track down the majority of patients. More than 90% of women were constant by negative cough trip the cough test. So this is at almost 20 years. This is what I tell patients. There's good data at almost to basically 20 years. And 87% were subjectively cured or improved. So by questionnaire, still approximately 90% of women were cured or improved. So pretty much happy. Of the 46 women that they could bring in to be examined, only one had a small mest extrusion, um, which they didn't really notice. So overall, even at 20 years, generally, if put in properly, a retropubic sling is safe and effective without any mesh complications, really. So what is better, bottom-up versus top-down? So in bottom-up, you make a, one makes a vaginal incision uh, and places the trocar behind the symphysis, very close uh, to the symphysis, through the retropubic space, out through the skin. Now, there's also the top-down approach. The top-down approach was developed because people felt a little bit more comfortable um, just being able to feel the symphysis from above, sort of a flatter plane, and bring the trocars down. But that may be a false sense, which we will discuss in a bit.
Then there are trans obturator slings. They are outside in and inside out approaches. Again, they were developed to avoid major bowel, vascular, nerve, and bladder complications believed to be due to the blind upward passage of trocars in the retropubic space. Again, there is something about the retropubic space, even though it's a space that makes people quite uh, nervous. So the thought was with the trans obturator sling that you could not get the bladder, which is not true. Um, but it definitely made people feel a little bit safer. Although instead of going through the space, then the, tr the trans obturator trocar and sling goes through the trans obturator space, which is actually full of muscle. There's also a neurovascular bundle that you could potentially hit in there. In 2001, the trans obturator approach was described. The first tape was called the ob tape. Uh, it had several problems. So one of the problems was it was a microporous mesh that let bacteria in, but not macrophages. And this led to significant complications, mostly due to the characteristics of the mesh and not the actual procedure. So then there was the Monarch transopter sling. Um, so 200 women underwent the Monarch transopter sling procedure. This was um, originally developed by AMS, the original AMS. Um, medium follow-up was 21 weeks, so this short-term follow-up, um, and 95% of subjects, uh, there was 95% of subjects reported subjective success rate. There were no bladder urethral perforations. It's true, it's very, it's very difficult to perforate the bladder, and there were no operative complications. However, there was lower extremity pain in 2.5% of patients, which is definitely unique to the trans obturator site. So then um, there was a very good study done with the TVTO, which is still available, um, of the inside out trans obturator tape. So 74% of patients underwent the TVT alone, TVTO alone, and 41 patients underwent a TVTO plus an anterior corporate. So very minimal anterior repair. The objective cure rate at four years was 82%, and an additional 7% were improved in the TVTO only group. So very good success rate, uh, greater than 90% of this study. The objective cure rate um, group was 80% with a, another 7.4%. <laughs> I'm in the cold room. Um, and the incidence of postoperative retention was approximately 8% and 7%. Mesh retraction occurred in two patients, so sort of feeling the mesh and being uncomfortable, uh, one in each group requiring revision of the sling. So it's, it's hinted that maybe the transoperative sling has more mesh complications in this one study, but we'll talk more about the other studies. So what's better, inside out versus outside in? Again, inside out, one makes a vaginal incision and passes the trocars uh, through the space, through the skin. And in the opposite, one makes a little stab incision and brings the trocars from the outside, hugging the bone in. So, so what's better inside out versus outside in? So the TVTO is an inside out trans obturator sling versus the Monarch, which we talked about, which is an outside in um, trans obturator sling. So this study looked at two to four years follow-up, the outcomes of the TVTO versus the monarch sling. There were 191 patients assigned to either TVTO, inside out, or monarch, outside in. Subjective cure rates at two to four years were 72% for the TVTO and 65% for the monarch. So slightly better in the inside out. And I probably because going inside out, you're able to target where the sling sits under the urethra a little bit better. After two to four years, both procedures were, however, equally safe and effective in curing stress during constant. So subjective um, cure rate was, was pretty similar two to four years. There were no differences in mesh erosion or avoiding dysfunction. So retropubic versus trans obturator slings, which is better? So this is uh, the study that I quizzed residents on the most. What is the study looking at retropubic versus trans obturator midurethral slings? This is called the Thomas study. Um, 597 patients, so a very good number of patients were randomized to either retropubic or trans obturator sling. At 12 months, the rate of objective success was 80%. And again, this is a very stringent, very strict definition, 80% in the retropubic group and 78% in the trans obturator group. The rates of voiding dysfunction requiring surgery was 2.7% in the retropubic uh, sling group versus 0% in the trans obturator group. 
However, the rate of neurologic symptoms, so weakness in the upper leg, groin numbness, was 4% in the retropubic group versus 9.4% in the transoperatory group, so almost 10%. Now, what I can say is that avoiding dysfunction, we can fix. If the sling is too tight, we can cut it. Um, neurologic symptoms are much more difficult to fix. There was a higher rate of UTIs in the retropubic group. Um, this probably goes along with the sling being slightly tighter. There were no significant differences between groups in postoperative urgency incontinence, satisfaction, or quality of life. So overall, both slings really were very safe and effective. There were no differences in mesh-related complications and overall no differences in subjective success rate, which really what is what matters, whether the patient feels that they're dry or not between the sling types, but there were some differences in complications as we said. Now, uh, there was a Cochrane view looking at the effects of minimally invasive synthetic slings uh, for stress or incontinence. There were 62 trials, including 7,100 women with moderate quality of evidence for most trials. Again, they're very difficult. It's extremely difficult to compare the different trials because success is totally different in all these studies. Um, so overall, minimally invasive synthetic suburethral sling operations appear to be as effective as traditional pubovaginal slings, but with shorter operating time and less postoperative voiding dysfunction and de novo urgency symptoms. So they are just as effective and they, the recovery is definitely less for the patient. They don't have to stay overnight. Overall, a retropubic bottom-up bottom -up approach was more effective than the top-down approach and incurred significantly less voiding dysfunction, bladder perforations, and tape erosions. Again, I think it's because you make the vaginal incision, you can really hug the bone from that angle going bottom up versus going top down. Uh, depending on the angle of sepsis, you just can't hug the bone that way. Um, as well, it's easier going bottom up to really target where you want the sling to sit in the on the urethra. Monofilament tapes, which are not really produced anymore, had significant, uh, rather, multifilament tapes are not really produced anymore, but monofilament tapes had slightly higher objective cure rates compared to multifilament tapes and fewer erosions. The obturator route was less favorable overall in uh, meta analysis than the retropubic route for objective cure, although there's no real difference subjective. Subject of cure, so I'm not sure if that really matters too much. However, there was less voiding dysfunction, blood loss, bladder perforation, and shorter operating time with the obturator rate. Again, pick your poison, um, but there's higher neurologic symptoms. So let's talk about single incision slings, which keep on emerging from the market, sort of coming off the market a little bit, um, but they seem to be here to stay. So single incisions were first introduced in, in 2006, so actually quite, quite a long time ago. They were developed with to theoretically minimize risk of post-operative pain with a more minimally invasive approach. They were actually really developed so that people could potentially do this in the office. I do not recommend that you do this in the office. So short-term outcomes and randomized prospective trials appear to be similar to those of traditional mid those slings short-term, but meta-analyses and intermediate term studies demonstrate quite inferior outcomes to traditional slings, but the newer studies show maybe some better outcomes and not really clear why, because the slings really haven't changed very much. Um, they are performed by some under local anesthesia in the office. I would not recommend this um, due to the fact that if you have bleeding, you really can't see and the sterility, et cetera, is difficult. And there is a place for these slings for patients who may desire future pregnancy. So uh, the TVT, most studies are done with the TVT Secure, which was the sling developed by Johnson & Johnson or Gynecare. Um, however, the TVT Secure is not actually available anymore. So 45 patients underwent a single incision sling. The mean post-operative follow-up was 30 uh, months. And at first follow-up, 62% of patients were cured. This was a very stringent definition. And 11 um, or 25% were, were improved. At last follow-up, 40% of patients were cured and 20% uh, were approved the failure rate of approximately 42%, so higher than for mid slings. Failures occurred as late as 24 months following surgery, so even though initial results may be promising, they don't seem to hold up as well. And 27% of patients underwent supplementary surgery with a traditional mid sling, so basically one in th almost one in three patients had to have another sling. Um, so then there was a, a good study randomizing a traditional transoperative sling, the TVTO versus a TVT secure. 
looking at, um, again, an intermediate range, two years. So this is a randomized trial, uh, approximately 60 patients in each arm. The primary outcomes were objective and sub subjective cure rates at 24 months. There were no differences in subjective cure rates in this study, 83% versus 77%. So pretty good study, actually. This is positive. There were no significant differences in subjective cure rates, but tape exposure rates were 5% for the TVTO, uh, fairly high actually. So it may just be the, the technique overall of this group and 7.5% for TVT uh, secure. So this is much higher than in, in other studies. Thigh pain was more common, not surprisingly, in the TVTO patients. So this study was a multi-center prospective randomized study looking at, again, a single incision mini sling versus a trans obturator sling at, at one year. So this is a short-term study, 130%, uh, 137 women were randomized to the BARD uh, adjust, which was an adjustable sling you pulled on a, 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 a suture. Um, currently Coloplast has a very uh, similar sling and the TVTO. There were no significant differences in one year in subjective su success rate and no significant differences in the need for repeat constant surgery, which was fairly high in both groups. Again, a little, a little different than in most studies. So the Altus is still around. This is made by Coloplast. Again, it's an adjustable single incision sling. Uh, 94 women were evaluated at, again, immediate term, 24 months. Cure was less than four grams on a pad uh, test, which is different than most studies that use one gram. So again, success is very different depending on what you define as success. 81% of subjects were dry at 24 months by objective criteria and 89% reported being dry. So this study is, shows very good results. Again, it's very conflicting, uh, the results of single incision sling. And only one revision occurred between 12 and 24 months. There's so much variation that I wonder if some of it is very dependent on um, your technique. So the Cochrane did, uh, luckily, a systematic review since the data is all over the place. 31 trials, it's quite a few trials, including 3,300 uh, women. Women were more likely to remain incontinent after single incision sling compared to uh, retropubic slings. The duration of the operation was slightly shorter for single incision slings, but there was a higher risk of data over urgency. Most comparison studies, really the best data is from the TVT Secure, which is unfortunately no longer available. So the slings that are available now are the uh, Altus, um, which is made by Coloplast, and as well AMS, uh, Boston Scientific still has a sling as well. So the single incision slings were, were results in higher incontinence rates compared to out, inside out transometer slings, so versus your TVTO. And single incision slings resulted in higher risk of mesh exposure as well, uh, as well as bladder, urethral exposure, and operative blood loss. Postoperative pain was less common with single incision slings, which makes sense. Um, although they do have these two plastic barbs, and there is overall insufficient evidence to compare transobturator retropubic slings uh, for stress for single incision slings other than the TVT Secure, which is no longer available. So the bottom line is with the slings on the market so far, there's not good enough evidence to suggest that they are really equivalent to mid other mid slings. That being said, there is definitely a place in certain populations, the patient who's not sure, who leaks a lot, who's not sure that they whether or not they want to have future children. And then there are some patients where you really just don't want to get into the retropubic space, the transopter space, et cetera. Uh, for example, um, the transplant patient who actually doesn't leak that much, but is bothered enough to have surgery. So then there are urethral bulking agents. Macroplastique has been around for quite a while, coaptite, and uh, the newer one on the market is Bulkamide, which has been on the market for quite a while, actually in Europe, Canada, Australia. So in the bulking agent, uh, one injects the agent uh, around the urethra, sort of at either the bladder, neck, or sphincter area. So here's a diagram. There are sort of two uh, main ways of injecting. You can put the scope in and inject through the scope, or you put, can put the scope in and inject, and inject um, around the scope. 
So the Cocker did a systematic review for balking agents in general. There were 14 trials included. Unfortunately, like the trials are really mostly not done, probably because most people don't really offer this to patients with significant stress during concerts because it, it, it's just sort of well known that injectables don't really work very well. There were 14 trials included, but the trials were all small and a moderate quality. There were really few randomized trials, basically none randomized to sling, and those published had small numbers. There were no differences in success between the periurethral and transurethral methods, but there was a higher rate of complications in the periurethral group. So equal success rate, but you can see better through the scope, probably better to do it through the scope. Um, the available evidence was really insufficient to guide practice. Placebo had similar symptomatic improvement to bulking agents. Um, there definitely was a lower success rate than for sling surgery. So lasers for stress during incontinence. Again, lasers are widely advertised, but little studied for stress during incontinence. There is one study out there by one person from the World Journal of Urology, which was a retrospe retrospective study comparing patients who underwent um, TVT, TVTO, and an uh, um, ER YAG laser called the Fontana Smooth. So this is not the Mona Lisa, which is a CO2 laser. Okay, so this study was done using a different laser. The objective success rate was looking at a one hour pad test, which has never been studied before. I mean, a short pad test would be 24 hours. This is a one hour pad test. No one's really sure what that means, but there were comparable improvements in a one hour pad test and improvements in symptom scores in this one study, but take it with a grain of salt. So IUGA, the International Urogynecology um, Association uh, Committee, put out a statement on vaginal lasers um, for the treatment of stress during incontinence syndrome, as well as other indications, including um, menopause symptoms and vaginal laxity. So basically, there are some small papers assessing one specific laser for stress during incontinence, demonstrating improvement in current symptoms without any serious side effects but there are no robustly conducted randomized control studies with long-term follow-up. So the therapeutic advantage of the non-surgical laser-based devices can only be recommended later and not now after there's actually been at least one randomized control study demonstrating safety and efficacy. So no real um, evidence so far. So let's talk about stem cell therapy. Stem cell therapy has been in development for a very long time, but still has not really emerged as a winner. So regenerative medicine is the field that aims at replacing or regenerating human cells, tissues, or organs to restore or establish normal function. Current research involves autologous muscle-derived stem or progenitor cells cultured in vitro and injected into the urethral sphincter. So the hope is of um, regenerating the urethral sphincter. However, I'm sure part of it is also that that's not just the mechanism for stress incontinence. A lot of stress incontinence is not just, as we know, the sphincter, but also the support tissues. So in theory, what happens is you take some cells from a muscle biopsy, they're treated in enzymes, broken down, laid on a Petri dish, and grown, and then injected back into the urethral sphincter. Simple as that. So this one study looked at, uh, was a feasibility study um, looking at safety and efficacy of autologous fascial muscle derived cells. Um, the company is called Cook Myosite as therapy for stress neuron incontinence. 38 women who had stress neuron incontinence not approved um, were enrolled and 33 patients, so a small number completed the study. They had, a needle biopsy of the quadricep muscles under local anesthesia. The tissue was then processed at a facility where muscle cells were extracted. And the return product was then injected with the cystoscope, kind of like an injectable, with injections into at least two areas by the external sphincter. Again, the thought was hopefully that this would then uh, regenerate the sphincter. At 18 months follow-up, patients who underwent two different treatments had uh, had a statistically significant reduction in mean pad weight, um, 15 to 12 versus the high dose had a pretty good improvement in pad weight, 15 to two grams. Um, there was a decrease in mean stress leak frequency in the high dose from four times a day to 0 0.4 times a day, which is pretty good. Um, not very good in less, there's some improvement, not as good in the low dose, seven versus three. 
Um, so overall, there were a few complications. So the injection did appear safe and there was a trend towards increased efficacy. However, this study was done in 2013 and there really have not been any positive good studies out since then. So my guess is that it probably is not working very well. So then there's the adjustable continence therapy or ACT device. This is a little balloon device, which is quite interesting. Um, so this device has been around longer in Europe, um, but now is available in North America, but not widely done. So basically a trocar is placed fluoroscopically and the implant is delivered through small incisions in the labia. Then the balloons are filled with contrast by injecting the balloons and the injection ports are placed in the labia majora. So in 2009, 162 subjects underwent implantation and about 140 patients completed the study to one year. So at one year, 52% of patients were dry and 80% were improved. So not as good as a sling, but you know, there's some improvement. There were definitely significant improvements in the symptom scores. Complications, however, occurred in about one, about one in four patients. So these included balloon erosion, perforation, infection, and pain. And this is at short term. At one year, there are quite a few complications. And the explantation rate was 18%. So pretty much one in five patients needed the device explanted. So it seems to somewhat work pretty high um, complication erosion rate. Then the sort of newest sort of therapy being developed is the Vessier device. And this is super interesting because this is based on a completely different theory than other, um, than other devices that are looking at basically ways to occlude the outlet. So the Vessier device is a free floating intravesical device constructed of a thin polyurethane film inflated with 30 milliliters of air. So basically it's literally a balloon that sits in the uh, bladder. It's basically an airbag for your bladder. The balloon is compressed during increased intravascular pressure acting as a shock absorber. So it's a completely different theory. So this is why this is very interesting. So there is a 12 month study uh, looking at a well done multi-center prospective randomized control study treating uh, using the Vessier intravascular balloon. So it was a sham controlled study. So you either had sham or this balloon. There were 221 participants that were randomized either to the Vessier balloon or placebo. And 40, only 43% of patients were evaluated at 12 months. So 55% of subjects were dry at three months, which is not bad. And 60% at 12 months. Um, in an intent to treat analysis, 33% had more than 50% reduction in pad weight from baseline. So there's definitely some improvements. Uh, however, there was not surprisingly a 26% discontinuation rate uh, within three months. 31% of patients discontinued between three and nine months. Adverse effects included not surprisingly dysuria, bladder irritation, suprapubic discomfort, UTIs, urgencies, makes sense. However, it's an interesting concept. So in summary, when we're talking about stress urinary incontinence procedures, minimally invasive midurethral slings have become the standard of care treatment for stress urinary incontinence. Compared to traditional autologous slings, synthetic slings, so mesh slings, appear to be equally successful with less post-operative voiding dysfunction, shorter operating time, and less de novo urgency. Both the retropubic and transobturator approaches are equally effective, so they're both good procedures, with a long-term success rate of approximately 80 to 90%. The objective success rates of retropubic slings may be higher than that of transobturator slings. Transobturator slings may be associated with more neurologic symptoms, but retropubic slings may be associated with more postoperative voiding dysfunction. The bottom-up versus top-down retropubic slings may be more effective than top-down retropubic slings with fewer bladder perforations and less voiding dysfunction. The short-term success rates of single incision slings may be similar to those of the standard mid slings, but in longer-term studies does not seem to hold up. More data is needed to assess the durability of the single incision slings and how outcomes compare to a standard mid sling procedure. They do appear to be associated with more mesh complications. So urethral bulking agents might be successful in the treatment of mid uh, mild stress urinary incontinence. There was recently a positive 
bulk meat study, but again, we need sort of more data to really recommend it. Intrauterine stem cell therapy appears promising, but really has not emerged. Vaginal lasers may be helpful in treating stress or incontinence, but there are really no trials, so maybe it helps. Uh, the Vesair device may be helpful in treating stress incontinence, but has a really high discontinuation rate. The adjustable continence therapy is a good option, well, is rather a surgical option for stress or incontinence. Um, but has a really high expectation and complication